So Irene Delreal is the next speaker, and she is a uh, just began a postdoc uh, at the University of Chile in Santiago, uh, where she did her bachelor's as well. And she's going to talk today about the PhD she recently finished at Cornell, Cornell University, where she studied controls on the metallogenesis um, of IOCG deposits using multiple microanalytical techniques for for high resolution chemical mapping of pyrite associated with uh, the Candelaria Punta de Cobra, Cobre uh, deposit, uh, ISG deposit um, in Chile. Before that, she's worked uh, a little bit in exploration uh, and also did a master's degree at the University of British Columbia link, uh, doing a project linking uh, alkalic and calc alkaline porphyry systems. So another hydrothermal, magmatic hydrothermal uh, expert to share uh, to share with us today. So Irene, I leave the floor to you. Thank you, Aaron. Um, well, as Aaron already introduced a little bit, first of all, I want to thank thank you guys for the invitation and thank all my collaborators. So I'm going to be talking about the geochemical and isotopic signature of pyrite, and we're going to use that signature as a proxy for understanding fluid source and evolution. In this case, specifically in the Candelaria Punta del Cobre IOCG district, so iron um, oxide, copper gold, in northern Chile. So uh, to start a little bit about IOCG deposits, um, they're widely distributed around the globe and also widely di distributed around time, where the oldest ones are from the Archean and the youngest ones are from the mid to late Mesozoic, which are the ones in the Andean belt that we're going to be talking a little bit more about. It's a controversial type of deposit in the sense that there is an uncertain origin and there's way more than one model to explain why we find IOCG deposits. Uh, they contain economically significant amounts of copper and gold and other minerals, and they share some significant characteristics between IOCG deposits. One of the main ones being that they have a significant amount of iron oxides, uh, mainly hematite and or magnetite. They have a strong, strong structural control, and this is also part of my research, but I'm not gonna be showing this today. And one of the main uh, characteristics is that they don't clearly show a relation with igneous intrusions. So this makes them quite different from what we know about porphyry intrusions or porphyry deposits, where we find mineralization related to an igneous intrusion. And by studying that igneous intrusion, we can actually understand more about fluids and how this mineralization occurred. So in ISG deposits, we don't have this igneous intrusion that we can use. And also we have quite a lack of quartz veins. So we have an issue doing any kind of uh, fluid inclusion study. So that uh, brings us to the question that I was trying to answer with this work. That is, what can we say about the mineralizing fluids? So we don't have an igneous intrusion. We don't have a lot of quartz veins. And for this, we have to start thinking about using proxies. And proxies, by definition, means that it's a figure that we can use to represent the value of something else. So we will study something else to understand the mineralizing fluids. In this case, we're going to do mineral chemistry, and we're going to specifically focus on pyrite. Why pyrite? Well, pyrite is ubiquitous in most IOCG deposits. Uh, it can occur in great quantities or very little, but in most IOCG deposits, we can find at least some pyrite. Uh, previous research, and not only in IOCG deposits, has shown that pyrochemistry uh, may be indicative of hydrothermal fluid chemistry and setting. And in this particular case, we started seeing since the beginning of this research that our pyrites in the Candelaria Punta Cobre district show quite a bit of chemical zonation, as you can see in some of the pictures in the, in the slide. And we decided that we could use this chemical zonation to try and understand how the fluids evolved in the district. So a little bit about the district, the Candelaria Punta del Cobre area is located in the Andean IOCG belt. This belt extends from central Chile all up until central uh, Peru. In the map, you, we, I can, I'm showing you what is the Chilean part looks like. And in red, you can see a square of the main district. So if we look at the district itself, there are it, at the moment nine active mines in the area where the Candelaria mine or deposit is by far the biggest one of all, but this is like just to show you guys how well endowed this district is and is actually uh, the best endowed district of the whole belt, uh, known up to date at least. So very uh, short, a little bit about the geology. Most of the mineralization is hosted in the Punta del Cobre formation. This formation, these are the oldest rocks in the district and we divide this formation into three main, main units. 
the first one is a lower unit that we call lower andesite. Then we have a central unit that is actually composed by two different lithologies that share the same stratigraphic horizon. One of them is a series of dacite domes, and the another one is a volcanic sedimentary sequence. And um, I love mentioning this because most of the mineralization is actually concentrated in the on the contact between this lower andesite and this stratigraphic horizon. Overlaying this, we have a uh, upper andesite. And with this on top of the Punta Alcore formation, we find a marine sedimentary basin that we call the Chañarcillo group. And it's divided in four main units, but we just care, at least as, as economic geologists, about the lower unit because there's some mineralization still hosted in the, in the contact between this upper andesite and the lower uh, sedimentary unit. So towards the northwest of the district, we find a batholith that we call the Copiapo batholith, where actually some of the units within the batholith are intruded or formed at the same time than mineralization. And this is 115 million years ago. Uh, one of the things we did realize during uh, my research is that actually we don't find any distinct evidence to relate fluids with you know, the intrusion of this batholith. So we can't really use the batholith to fully understand the hydrothermal fluid. So this is a, what I'm going to show you now is a very analytical work and it's very specific. And for that, we actually need to do a very, very good selection of samples because for the amount of work we, we did, we can't actually, you know, sample 100 pyrites. So just to mention that the sampling we did was trying to represent the main units, as we see in the stratigraphic column, but also time in terms of the time and uh, related to mineralization. So of our samples, uh, these are all pirate samples. We have a first group that are samples that are pre-mineralization. We have a second group that are pirate samples from the main mineralization. And these ones we divide them and mineralized ore bodies that are hosted in specific stratigraphic horizons or ore bodies that are hosted in fault, so structurally controlled. And then we have a third group that is late mineralization. And as you can see uh, in the sample photo very nicely, these are mainly veins that cut the main mineralization event and alteration. And finally, we have a fourth group that I just called Las Pintadas because it's the name of the deposit that we, were, that we studied that is mineralization hosted uh, close or just above the Punta del Core formation. So quite a bit above the, strat the main stratigraphic horizon where we find mineralization. So um, I used a lot of analytical techniques. So these are very, very, very studied pyrites. <laughs> I think of the original samples, there's not much left. Uh, we looked at, at the mineral chemistry. For this, I use uh, Synchrotron XRF to do chemical maps, all quantified, electron microprobe to look at major elements, and laser ablation ICPMS to look at minor uh, or trace elements. These three uh, sets of data sets were actually all uh, correlated and integrated, and I can explain if somebody has any questions about that. I have a whole paper about it. But the results I'm going to be showing here are focused on just four elements. Why? Because these are the four most interesting elements that we, see, we saw. So these are nickel, cobalt, arsenic, and selenium. But we integrated all this mineral chemistry data with in situ sulfur isotope composition. And we did this using a SIMS, so secondary iron mass spectrometry. Why sulfur isotopes? Because we can constrain the source of hydrothermal fluids looking at the sulfur isotope signature. So we just have to keep in mind though that sulfur isotopes are sensitive to temperature, pH, and oxygen fugacity. So it's not just you know, seeing a number and uh, providing a source. So I'm gonna show you a couple of results from the maps and some you know, main characteristics. So the first thing we're seeing here, this is a sample from the main mineralization that we call Manto. Manto, these are the ore bodies that are hosted in stratigraphic horizons. And what we see here is uh, quite a bit of chemical variation in the composition of the pyrites. We see high nickel in the cores, low arsenic and cobalt. We see a limited variation of selenium and we also see a limited variation of sulfur isotopes. These are mainly between one and 1 1.5. And one thing I'm just gonna note in this specific sample is that within this, this set of samples of the main realization of the manto, we actually find a perotite, which we don't find in other samples, as you can see here in the photo. Uh, so what happens when we go up, up, up in the stratigraphy? So this is Las Pintadas. Uh, we are near or just below this marine sedimentary sequence. Uh, we see a, difficult, a different chemical composition. We see low nickel. We see arsenic only in the rims. 
high cobalt in the core and high selenium in the core and rim. So this is different from the previous sample. But again, our sulfur isotope values are quite well constrained, again, between 1 and 1.5. So here is a little bit, a little different sample. So this is uh, late mineralization. This is actually the same sample I showed you in the photo before that is the, this main cut in the main mineralization alteration. Uh, again, we see, you know, quite a lot of variability within the chemistry of the pyrite. We see variable nickel, um, high arsenic, variable cobalt, low selenium. But in this case, our sulfur isotopes are quite different. We actually see a larger range that goes from plus six to plus 10. And these are quite more positive numbers than the samples that we were looking at before. So what happens when we look at the pirate elemental composition by looking point by point? So this is mainly the laser ablation and electron microprobe data set. Uh, we see, see a significant variation in most elements. Um, one thing that I find very interesting here is that our separation of samples between group, you know, and this is mainly se separation between time, does not really, you know, group any samples here. It's all quite mixed together. And what we see is that nickel tends to be higher and mostly in samples from lower stratigraphic levels, which we interpret this that it could be a, a control of temperature on nickel, where nickel will be uh, more abundant at higher temperature. There's a positive correlation trend between cobalt and arsenic, and there's a positive, positive correlation trend between selenium and nickel. Um, our sample LP1, which is from group four, so this is the sample I was showing in the slide before, up, 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 in the stratigraphy, is actually quite off of trend from the main trends we see in the samples. And one, you know, one reason of why we see this could be because it's hosted in different host drops. Um, yep. And what happens when you look at the sulfur isotope values, but as a whole? So, you know, here's a simple histogram. And one thing I want to mention is that we have one histogram for pyroid, another one for calcopyroid. And as you can see, they're quite similar. So that, you know, is also giving us the information that both events happen together. We see quite a bit of range of results. We see from minus two to plus 10, but the main realization um, samples are all between minus one to plus two. And the mantle signature or the, these ore bodies are hosted in this, this stratigraphic horizon all are between one and 1.5. Before that, we have to be careful with sulfur isotopes, not jump on to, in conclusions, especially when we have uh, iron oxides. Why? Because sulfur isotopes can be more sensitive to oxygen fugacity than temperature. And this is a system where we see uh, magnetite, hematite, so we already see uh, oxygen fugacity change in there. We'll see moschitovite, which is a uh, specular hematite replaced by magnetite. So basically that is telling us that our iron oxide story is quite complex. And that all means also that our oxygen fugacity story is quite complex. We do know that sulfur isotopes will tend to be more negative at higher oxygen fugacity values. But we also know that when we have pyrite and equilibrium with pyrotide and magnetite, so this is just remembering uh, the sample from the mantle that I showed before, our redox influence or the oxygen fugacity influence on sulfur isotopes is not that strong. And we can actually relate that signature to the source of the fluid, which in this case, again, is between one to 1.5. And we can assume that that is a more magmatic hydrothermal uh, source than, for example, something more positive, closer to 10, that could be an external fluid. So we can also use a uh, pirate uh, chemical composition for assessing sources, so not only sulfur isotopes. In this case, we use the ratio of cobalt against nickel. And one thing I want to mention is that we have anomalously high cobalt and nickel contents in these uh, samples. Nickel can go up to 1%, cobalt can go up to 2%. And if we look into the literature, what we find is that these uh, these numbers for nickel and cobalt can be more related to a mafic, a mafic magmatic fluid source. We have some ratios that are near to 100, and these are mainly related to the samples that have very little to nearly no nickel. But in general, the results we're, we are seeing are quite similar to those observed in Los Colorados, which is an iron oxide apatite deposit. And a lot of research relates these deposits quite closely to IOCG ones and um, the Ernest Henry IOCG deposit. So we're not seeing something like super weird for IOCG deposits. These are, these are numbers that we would expect to see. So this is the final part, which I think is probably one of the most interesting ones, is what happens when we integrate pyrite uh, chemistry with their sulfur isotope signature. 
so one of the things I just want to mention is that we were very anal about this study and that in terms that we wanted to actually correlate point by point the chemistry with the sulfur isotopes, which meant that we actually analyzed point, the same points for every kind of analysis. So in this, um, in this sense, I also want to, want to say that one of the main things we learned in this study is that it's not about, you know, comparing the chemistry, you know, like nickel or cobalt alone against the sulfur isotopes. It's more about thinking about processes. So in this case, I'm showing two diagrams. One is a nickel selenium ratio. And we use this ratio because it's redox sensitive. And we, tr we plot it against sulfur isotopes that, as I mentioned before, is quite redox sensitive. What we see is a rough trend where our late sample, that are these ones over here, so in this case, we actually do see some grouping between the timing of the samples, have a higher sulfur isotope signature and a higher nickel selenium ratio number. But, you know, there is this big group, and these are the main realization samples, I would say, that are kind of off trend. And uh, we interpret this mainly because nickel is still pretty controlled by temperature. So we're probably seeing a function of temperature uh, in this case over here. And then we also use selenium sulfur, and we can use this for analyzing sources against uh, sulfur isotopes that we can also use for analyzing sources. And in this case, we see a really neat and pretty well established mixing trend where our late samples all have higher um, sulfur isotope signatures and lower selenium sulfur ratios. And our main mineralization samples, most of them have lower sulfur isotope values and higher selenium sulfur ratios. And one interesting thing here is that both you know, extremes of this mixing trend represent different sources, where in one part we have source, a source that is magmatic derived, and another part over here we see a source that is basinal seawater derived or external fluids. So, and because we know the timing of the samples, what we see is that most of the main realization samples are all, most of them are in this magmatic derived um, square, whereas most of our late samples are all, you know, in the basin derived or external uh, derived um, area. And because we know the timing, we actually can say that these late samples are in implicated in that the inclusion of external fluids within the system occurs late, and the most of the mineralization occurs from a magmatic derived source. So that is all, you know, a little bit of information for this uh, model uh, eternal fight that we see in IOCG deposits. So just very briefly, some conclusions. So we can use uh, cobalt-nickel ratios to talk about sources, and what we see is that the fluids have a mafic affinity. Uh, sulfur isotopes integrated with nickel selen uh, selenium ratio suggest redox variation, but I would say we, you know, we, to, we need to work better on this one because of the strong control of temperature on nickel. Uh, when we integrate sulfur isotopes with selenium sulfur ratios, we do see a really nice mixing trend between a magmatic hydrothermal fluid and an externally derived probably from a basin fluid. Let's remember that we have a marine sedimentary basin on top of the main mineralized host rocks. And that, but the majority of the samples fall within the range of magmatic hydrothermal fluid source. So what can we say at least about the Candelaria Punta Alcora deposit is that most of the mineralization in this deposit comes from a magmatic hydrothermal fluid source. And there is an, um, an incursion of uh, fluid, of external fluids, but this is late. We don't know if how much of the mineralization is related to this, but we can say that not, it's probably not significant. And finally, I really love working with pyrochemistry. I thought integrating it with sulfur isotope was amazing, but I think we have to think about processes, not only chemical concentration when we integrate this kind of data sets. And with this, I just wanna say gracias, and I would be happy to take any questions.